I have to do this at my music gigs. I, uh, just not feeding back is kind of a big deal. Okay, um, can you hear me all right? All right. Um, thank you, Rory. It, it is a great honor to be here. Um, I want to thank Rory Dicker and Mona Frederick for the invitation. I want to thank Rory for taking me around Vanderbilt today and uh, everyone who's made this event possible. I particularly want to acknowledge Allison's friends, family, and loved ones who, who made the journey to be here today. I hope that this account of her writing does some justice to the, women, the woman that we knew. Um, Allison was best known as a feminist literary critic with a strong focus on disability. But academic writing was insufficient to Allison's range and creativity, and she brought a different kind of energy to her informal writing op-eds, articles, and blogs. Today I want to focus on her blog, Every Little Thing, which ran from 2013 to 2016. My thoughts about Every Little Thing are spurred by a rereading. While Allison was alive, I read her blog for her voice, her insights, her humor. But I also read it for news. I wanted to know how she was, and I wanted to know without asking about her prognosis. To read it in real time was to follow her story without knowing its end. To read it afterward was utterly different. I began to see it as a single piece of writing. Before Allison passed away, I agreed to edit and complete her finished, unfinished manuscript. I soon brought on Rachel Adams, another friend of Allison's and also a parent of a child with Down syndrome, as co-editor and co-author. As part of my research for that project, I reread every little thing straight through. I was looking for paragraphs or sentences I could use, possibly even for a personal chapter cobbled together from blog posts and unpublished material. As I read, though, I came to see that plucking paragraphs from context does Allison a disservice. The writing is already in the context that Allison chose. I later learned that Allison wrote poems in college. This didn't surprise me. I had come to see her as a creative writer as well as a scholar, talents which she merged in her blog. Though that blog began as a casual home for, as she put it, random crap, it evolved into something much more, an open-ended digital essay informed by feminist principle exploring the troubled boundary between disability and disease. For those unfamiliar with Allison's work and writing, I want to introduce her by reflecting on three key words in my title, accessible, boundaries, and disability. Accessible. Whether scholarly or informal, Allison's writing, as Rory mentioned, was strikingly accessible without surrendering complexity. This was not an accident. Her wish was always to connect, to further the conversation with as wide an audience as possible. As a result, she published not only with university presses and scholarly journals, but also in the Charleston City Paper, the New York Times, and her blog. Her voice in those writings was often the voice of your favorite professor, knowledgeable, clear, warm, the one you could talk to after class. The word access has special significance in disability studies and disability rights. To understand why, you need only look around you. The sign language interpreter makes it possible for more people to receive these words. The elevator just outside, the doors wide enough for a wheelchair, not to mention the curb cuts outside, make it possible for people with mobility impairments to be present in the first place. Features like these, according to historian of, de historian of design Bess Williamson, constitute the most literal form of access. But they embody a much broader set of meaning, meanings linked to a more inclusive society with greater opportunities for social and political participation. Like disability studies itself, access lives at the meeting point of scholarship and activism. So, of course, did Allison. Her blog aimed at that more inclusive society. It was accessible writing in the service of access. Boundaries. For Allison, boundaries were generally things to ignore, step over, redraw, or tear down. Academia depends on boundaries. Allison tended to cross them. She was teacher and activist, scholar and essayist. She read canonical literature and girl zines, feminist theory, and romance novels. As a researcher, she crossed disciplinary lines, speaking to geneticists, physicians, and genetic counselors, and interviewing women who, faced with a down, an, an diagnosis of Down syndrome in utero, either terminated or carried to term. 
One reason I was drawn to Allison's writing and became friends with her is that we shared a common experience of parenting and disability. That experience tends to redraw conceptual boundaries. Though the experience is believed by many to be tragic, it is often joyful. Though the condition is framed as abnormal, a parent's experience reframes normality itself. For me, as I think was true for Allison, having a daughter with, dis with a disability has erased boundaries, redrawn them, and made them porous. It's put me in touch with people I never would have known, has enlarged my own thinking about people and writing, and has lowered the boundaries between friendship, activism, creativity, scholarship, and self-expression. Disability. Allison defined disability as an embraceable form of diversity. I assume, as did Allison, that disability is produced by the body in context that observable features, like an extra chromosome or restricted growth, are the beginning of the story and not the end. Without cut curb cuts, as the reporter Joseph Shapiro wrote in his book No Pity, a city block for someone in a wheelchair is an island. Without appropriate supports, many people with intellectual disabilities are effectively excluded from the community. Allison had two central experiences of disability. As the mother of Maybell, who has Down syndrome, and as a woman with cancer, which was disabling, particularly in regard to language. For her, questions of disability were not theoretical, but immediate. I think that this is why academic writing was only part of what she did. Narrative, m image, metaphor, wit, all were needed to convey the meaning of disability and disease. For this reason, I came to see Allison's blog as a long, open-ended personal essay, a heterogeneous form, accessible to varied audiences, and hospitable to both critical and creative approaches. Every little thing reveals an essayist's instincts. The sudden flashes of wit, the impulse towards open-ended inquiry, and towards furthering that inquiry with metaphor, image, and narrative. The grounding of ideas in the senses, the informal address to the reader, confiding rather than declaiming, a sense of play, especially with form, a consideration of form's political implications. Every little thing became a place where Allison could use her whole brain and reflect on her whole life, where personal narrative and feminist analysis and explorations of disability could be blended, either seamlessly or, more often, with the seams deliberately showing. With that, I'd like to identify some key essayistic elements in every little thing its distinctive features, both rhetorical and thematic. I'll then show how that approach altered under the pressure of illness, especially, especially after early August 2014. For the writer Philip Lopate, the essay is essentially conversational. Personal essays, essayists converse with a reader, he writes, because they are already having dialogues and disputes with themselves. Allison had dialogues and disputes with herself, and she illuminated these interior conversations to spark a larger conversation in the world. But to a remarkable extent, every little thing is composed of conversations with others, particularly with people whose experiences differed from hers. Allison listened and talked across boundaries. She was radically open to the voices of others in a way that lots of people approve of, but very few actually are. She did so, I think, for many reasons, but one might be that people with intellectual disabilities are rarely heard, let alone listened to. There was a connection, I think, between the world being accessible to Maybell and Allison making herself accessible to the world, taking voices in, even or especially those with which she disagreed. On October 11th, 2013, Allison described a conversation with a doctor at the annual education meeting of the National Society for Genetic Counselors. The scene is narrated using bullet points. I'll just raise my hand for each new point. I'm a huge advocate of abortion rights, but it was a little weird yesterday talking to an MD who performs abortions. Among other things, she said, this one couple saw that TV show with the kid with mosaicism. Life goes on with Chris Burke, who doesn't have mosaic Down syndrome. And they said, our baby might be nearly normal. I said, no, that's not realistic. I didn't let this doctor know that I have a child with Down syndrome because I wanted to hear her real unfiltered thoughts, and wow, were they troubling. For instance, she was shocked that people might adopt a child with Down syndrome. Maybe it's a psychological thing, she said. They'll never have an empty nest. 
Believe it or not, she actually told me that all people with Down syndrome get Alzheimer's. First, this isn't true. Second, it's something I criticized in my talk on Wednesday. Do we need to be talking about Alzheimer's when a child isn't even born yet? Allison's scene with commentary illuminates the false boundaries that people sometimes trace around disability. The doctor falsely equates Down syndrome to Alzheimer's disease and implies that parents are mentally unwell, needy, damaged, a psychological thing. Bullet points were a staple of Allison's style. They were probably generative for her, a way to write quickly, a quick and dirty way to give form to her darting intellect. They allowed her a language of impressions, glimpses, and insights. They allowed her swift cuts from one perspective to another, and they freed her from narrative. In this case, rather than telling the story of an entire encounter, she breaks out the relevant moments of dialogue in order to highlight medically ratified misconceptions. One part of Allison's work was to identify and dissect misconceptions like these. Another was to refute them. She does this directly, of course, but she also does so in narrative terms. In the blog, the frequent conversations with Maybell serve this purpose, highlighting Maybell's personhood and personality. This one, for example, from May of 2013, takes the form of a three-line play, a brief dialogue between Maybell and Allison that nonetheless has a lot to say about motherhood, domesticity, and negotiation. So here's what happens with Maybell. She gets her waffles drenched in syrup, not drizzled. Her waffles aren't a dry bread product with just a bit of syrup flavoring them. They are soaked with log cabin. Each bite is heavy and dripping. There's a pool of syrup on her plate when she's finished. A common waffle conversation is, Maybell, syrup. Allison, full sentence, please. Maybell, I want more syrup, please. And then I comply. I like the... <laughs> I like the ironies of this compressed moment focused on the word comply. Who's really in charge here? It's a negotiation any parent can identify with, a brief transaction over food. In this case, syrup is traded for language. <laughs> At the same time, it's specific to Down syndrome. Language is both difficult and critical for people with Down syndrome, and requiring a full sentence both entails enforcing a standard and helping a future child fit into the world. Two conversations, one in bullet points, the other is dialogue. Allison was both deliberate and playful in her choices, thinking about how to tell the story, playing with formal conventions. Appropriately enough, for her interest in conversation, Allison's blog is filled with greetings to people as well as to things. Hello, ugly car. Hello, new house. Hello, Society for Disability Studies. Hello, travel, thinking new ways. Hello, possible ways of writing multiple things with a focus on my book. I love it. I want to write it. I love it. She hailed friends, including me. She says, good morning hair and good morning day. These buoyant greetings show someone who is ready to converse with people in the world and to report on the conversation. At the same time, Allison does more than report. She reflects on the conversation itself, who is in it, how it works rhetorically, and how it relates to her feminist ideals and her goal of justice for people with disabilities. Allison's blog, as its title suggests, is filled with the details of daily life. She pays attention to the little things, even or especially while contemplating larger ones. On uh, November 13th, 2013, for example, she wrote a post entitled Important Life Truths. These are bullet points too. If you leave wet Cheerios on the floor for three or more days, <laughs> they become so bonded to the wood that you have to use a strong spatula to release them. <laughs> Bananas are repulsive, but they're easy to carry to work, so you should eat them. <laughs> These are snapshots of domestic life, but they are also parodies of advice about how to live, itself a perennial subject of the essay. Moments like these are reminiscent of Kenko, the 14th century Buddhist monk, whose essays in idleness are now considered a forerunner of the modern essay. Kenko had a keen idea for ordinary absurdities. Um, the, cer the ceremonial hats had gotten bigger at court, he reports, and so people had to get new, larger lids for their hat boxes. Were this deadpan advice for living? You should never put the new antlers of a deer to your nose and smell them. They have little insects that crawl into the nose and devour the brain. <laughs> In Allison's post, the title Important Life Truths highlights the incongruity between grand ideals and the actual business of daily living. 
an incongruity magnified by the use of bullet points, as if these were important action items on a company memo. Allison was funny in person and on the page. This comes through in titles like Bitch Mother and Unitarian Easter, All of the Fun, None of the Jesus. <laughs> Essays are often winding, digressive explorations, but the best essayists know when to explore and when to let a descriptive fragment stand on its own. In context, floor-bonded Cheerios and bananas that you hate but eat anyway resonate with larger themes in the blog, including domesticity and the opposition of health to pleasure. But the paradox of seeing large things through small ones is firmly in essay territory. Allison's attention to the little facts of daily life, food, clothes, appearance, cleaning, also reveals her as an astute social observer. Fashion, for example, is a comic thread throughout the blog. Allison's friends trying to dress her in something besides slacks and a Star Wars t-shirt, Allison mystified as to why she should care. In February of 2013, for example, she reflects on a pair of shoes. She is going to a party, and a student suggests different shoes from the ones she's bought. She takes a picture of them and writes, I'm not opposed to those shoes, I just don't understand them. So they're cute, apparently, but I have no means of assessing them. I suspect I'd look ridiculous in them, but maybe I'm going to look ridiculous in the other ones. Another lesser writer would have stuck with ironic distance, wearing a Star Wars shirt with pride, expressing contempt for people who care about how they look. Allison's approach was far more interesting. She combines immersion and distance while suspending judgment. She is open to the experience of enjoying a particular pair of shoes, is willing to try it out, but just doesn't see it. In a similar post, she narrates being taken to sexy siren aerobics, where she has a good time but finds the experience completely ridiculous. There's a surprising parallel, in fact, between Allison's approach to sexy siren aerobics and her approach to the annual education conference of the National Society of Genetic Counselors. As an outsider, she's open to a new experience, open to the possibility of good people, ready to engage, but at the same time conscious of the inherent absurdities. She did not hold herself apart. Which entails contradiction. And like many essayists, Allison was more interested in distilling contradiction than resolving it. In this post from February 13th, 2014, Allison's new hair, we find Allison trying to get a good haircut before the annual Yes, I'm a Feminist party. This morning, I called the salon and discovered that the only time I could get a wee dad haircut before February 25th, the date of Charleston's best feminist party ever, was this afternoon. So I texted Maybelle's favorite babysitter at the very last minute, not that unusual for me really, and had to admit to her that she'd be hanging with Maybelle so that I could succumb to the white supremacist, supremacist capitalist patriarchy. <laughs> I actually think this may be the best haircut yet. Moments like these exemplify Philip Lopate's point that essayists turn a private conversation into a public one. From about early 2014 on, that conversation was increasingly about illness and disability. Faced with the return of her cancer and its disabling effects, Allison responded with imagination, marshalling the themes and techniques of the blog to explore the troubled boundary between disability and disease. Throughout every little thing, cancer and Down syndrome are conceptually distinct. One is a disease, something to treat and cure. The other is a disability, an embraceable form of diversity, and Maybelle was the one she embraced. In a society where disability is too often medicalized, Allison stood up for a broader, more accepting view, distinguishing the he diverse human bodies we welcome from the diseases we seek to cure. In the blog, Allison enacts this distinction in narrative terms, performing it in memorable, ordinary details. Disability was Down syndrome, Maybell, the breakfast table, an embraceable form of diversity, home. Disease was cancer, the enemy of life and hope, the anti-home. On the one hand, there were Ralph's butter twists, a simple evening reading to Maybell, a canoe outing with Brian, on the other, the exhaustion and nausea of chemo, an insensitive doctor, the loathed smell of antiseptic soap. One brought her to the welcome table of love, companionship, motherhood, connection to others, new ways of thinking about people. The other divided her from life and pleasure and impaired her ability to express herself. 
Reading comments on Allison's blog and on Facebook threads discussing the, top, b discussing the blogs, it was refreshing to see a total absence of confusion on the point. Nobody got disease and disability mixed up. Everyone treasured Maybell as a person, honored her as a person in relation to family and community and individual. Everyone wished Allison's glioblastoma gone. It would have been perfectly understandable if Allison had simply sketched the extremes that we, the readers, assented to. It was typical then that Allison questioned even this distinction, finding the places where the boundary between disability and disease was porous and uncertain. As the disability theorist G. Thomas Couser writes, the border between disability and illness is not always clear. Illness can cause disability. Some conditions, like chronic pain, can be classified in either category or both. Allison's exploration of the boundary between disability and disease was rooted in intellectual honesty. She believed that writing needed to be equal to the world's complexity. On June 28, 2014, she declared what amounts to an aesthetic. Complexity, as we all know, is a critical element of critical thinking and of a crucial element of critical thinking and of provocative, substantive writing. So it is no surprise that she lived up to that aesthetic in every little thing. But her exploration was also driven by personal experience. Allison was the mother of a girl with Down syndrome. She also had brain cancer. These two radically different conditions converged in surprising ways. And one question that preoccupied her was the question of independence. In very different ways, Mabel and Allison were rendered partially dependent on others, and Allison wrote searchingly about this topic, exploring her own contradictions. It's almost an article of faith in disability studies that pure independence is a fiction. We are interdependent. We rely on one another. Allison argued for this view, and yet faced with seizures that kept her from driving, she chafed at her loss of independence. What resulted was an inner dialogue, a private conversation that she made eloquently public. On March 20th, 2014, Allison posted a raw, self-interrogating meditation. There's a very good chance that I'll never be able to drive again. I'll never be able to drive again. It almost makes me tear up to write that, sitting here in the lobby of the Greyhound station. I haven't written much here about my seizures. I haven't written about them as a disability, even though they clearly are disabling. I am a person who studies disabilities in great depth. It's the focus of my scholarship, and I do a fair amount of activism around it too, so why don't I want to acknowledge my own disability? Fear, I think, and ego. Fear because the seizures are connected to the brain tumor, and the brain tumor is connected to my mortality. Fear because I don't want them to get worse and force me to reimagine my personal and professional life. Ego because I want to be a person who drives. I'm not the kind of person who rides a bus, my ego announces. It's unacceptable. I feel ashamed to be a person who has to take cabs or ride a greyhound. Flying is, of course, perfectly accessible, acceptable, as is taking a cab to the airport. Those things can be almost prestigious, so I have no weird feelings there. But not being able to drive to the grocery store or the bank or a speaking engagement a few hours away feels shameful. It's class-based, of course, and based on my desire for independence, for, my abil for the ability to control my own movements. I get that this is troubling, irrational, contradictory to some of my deeply held beliefs about accessibility, identity, and human value. I get it. I'm not defending this. But I'm feeling it, and now I'm writing about it. First time, right? Here I am, feminist disability studies scholar, discussing my own disability, discussing my fucked up conflicts, conflicts I'm going to need to address. Every little thing is filled with conversations, but here the conversation is internal, the inner dialogue literal. The ego, personified, speaks. This is a paradoxical move. Allison both owns a distasteful sentiment and distances herself from it as if it were both her and exterior to her, which, as a culturally absorbed point of view, it actually is. As is always the case, Allison's reflections are vividly anchored to place. Reflecting on the body, Allison insists on embodied experience, locating us in the Greyhound station. She connects driving not to the abstract idea of mobility, but to the grocery store or the bank or a speaking engagement. In other words, driving is linked not only to independence in general, but to Allison's domestic and professional life. On June 25th, 2014, Allison provided an update. Her neurologist cleared her to drive. In a decision that mystifies me to this day, she celebrated this milestone by acquiring a PT Cruiser. <laughs> 
Though it's been only three months since her post in the Greyhound station, she has come to accept that she does have a disability, that she does depend on others. And she writes, Driving a car doesn't make me think that I don't have a brain tumor. It hasn't allowed me to trick myself into thinking I'm a person who doesn't have seizures and who might never have big ones again. I'm a person with a disability. I'm a person who has seizures and a brain tumor. This is something I'm grappling with and that I know I'll be writing more about. So this is what I think might be happening. I couldn't, can't, recognize my disabilities. And as a partial result of that, I haven't been able to recognize my fears, my limitations, when I'm in the midst of them. For the last three years, I often felt anxious, sad, exhausted, being a person who can't do many, many things without the help and support of friends. But I didn't know the depth of those feelings. This acceptance, though nuanced and partial, provide, produces a transcendent moment of respite. Right now, she writes, the feelings are diminished, and the sense of lightness this brings to my body, like I'm full of oxygen, I'm shining through every pore, is allowing me something new. At some level, I'm afraid that this won't last. Now that I know what it means, it will be so painful to lose it. But there's no way to know, so I'm trying to be in the present moment. As I said in the city paper column, hello, ugly car. Welcome to the family. <laughs> Here we see Allison's habit of greeting, hello, ugly car. But we also see her talent for figurative speech. I'm full of oxygen. I'm shining through every pore. Allison was ill, but her language is radiantly alive. From mid-2014 on, the blog focuses increasingly on these moments of peace. The condition that made her intensely aware of time passing made it difficult for her to enjoy each moment. So she valued and shared the moments of pure pleasure when she was able to be fully present. I see these moments as extensions of Allison's meditations on the idea of home. They are typically described in the company of loved ones and food, but they broaden home beyond the literal, showing us Allison at home in time, at home in her body. On August 22nd, 2014, she describes getting cinnamon rolls with her mom only a week after surgery. And there's a picture. As we took this picture of ourselves, I realized that it's been more than a week since I've had a moment like this, sitting in a pastry coffee shop, having a cinnamon roll ourselves, as we waited for it to be time to head back to school. It felt like a new kind of real life. Like, oh right, this is the sort of thing my life can look like. On March 1st, 2015, she describes a moment with her partner, soon to be husband, Brian, at a barbecue restaurant. Ultimately, as I sat there with a barbecue sandwich, I felt myself somehow calm down and let the cells go. They aren't all going to go away. Going to go away. All the oncologists have said this. So I want them to lie down, drifting. Some are just shrunk and out of energy. They don't require me to be a warrior. They just need to be allowed to disappear as I do the things that are part of my medical process. I don't want my body to be a space of domination, a space where I imagine myself as fierce. Instead, I want to be soothing to myself. I want to breathe. Again, we see Allison's talent for metaphor used to convey the complexities of interior life. We've already seen the way she ascribes unwanted thoughts about disability to ego, both claiming and rejecting them. Here, something similar and almost shocking occurs. She declines to be at war, to be a space of domination. And so her account of her cancer cells is almost autobiographical. She associates them <clears throat> with exhaustion and wishes them the peace that she wishes for herself. They aren't all going to go away, she writes. All the oncologists have said this, so I want them to lie down, drifting. Some are just shrunk and out of energy. She conveys a difficult, partial acceptance. But this metaphor also has a social di dimension. With it, Allison is responding to comments on the blog urging her to fight cancer. In a gentle but definite way, she rejects this framing. And she says, other people do find this approach, the attack on the tumor, to be satisfying at multiple levels, so I'm not saying that these loving statements are in any way troubling or inappropriate. They just aren't for me. They aren't what I want, what I need. With this, Allison both dissects a problematic metaphor and replaces it with a better one. That she could do this, show, um, that she could do so, shows the range of her talents, but it also shows a principled wish to do more than criticize to offer a positive alternative to guide and advance the conversation. To do so, Allison not only depends on her skill with words, she also exploits the online possibilities of the blog. Conversation here is literal, not an academic metaphor. 
These moments of respite with Maybelle, with Brian, with Kelly, are moments of feeling at home in the world. More than any literal place, home really stands for connection, what Allison called the welcome table, the place where we sit down together. And its opposite is the denial of connection. What matters most are the relationships that sustain us wherever they occur. Those relationships are constituted in part by conversation. Allison's blog, then, was a way of bearing witness to the relationships that mattered to her while reaching out to new people. For Allison, the act of writing also helped her achieve these moments of being at home in the world. Writing was a way to embrace and resist time's passing. She makes this explicit in a late post entitled, Everything Has Changed. She says, I'm writing because writing gives me a space, a space where I have a moment to reflect. As Brian pointed out in an essay published after Allison's death, time and mortality were at the core of everything Allison did. She was always writing because she knew that her time was likely limited, but this awareness lent her writing not only urgency, but vitality. Though I see every little thing as an extended essay, it is also kin to other artworks governed by arbitrary formal constraints. I think of A.R. Ammon's Tape for the Turn of the Year, a long diaristic poem written on an adding machine tape, which ended when the tape ran out, or an early performance piece by Laurie Anderson, who stood on a block of ice wearing ice skates, playing a violin until the ice melted. Allison's blog matched the arc of her life, and because she was open about the fact of her cancer, you knew, reading it, that the tape was finite, that the block of ice was melting, that she was typing away and making music anyhow. The boundary between disease and disability was troubled by the question of independence, but it was also troubled by language itself. Down syndrome and cancer, though radically different conditions, impact both language and cognition. Allison and was definite and categorical that Maybell was fine, just as she was, challenges with words at all, and all. And yet, as a writer and scholar, she fiercely resisted the loss of language in herself. As a result, Allison faced, with rare honesty, a difficult question. What, it, what did it mean to say, on the one hand, that one can be fully human despite the impairment of language? while at the same time grieving one's own impairment. The conundrum was complicated by the fact that the loss of language might result not from cancer, but from its treatment. In an impossible choice, what Allison would have called zugzwang, she had to set life against language. On August 3rd, 2014, Allison wrote that the tumor was growing again, that an operation was imminent, and that the tumor is in the language center of my brain. And she says, I asked my uncle how I decide. If I allow the neurosurgeon to take out more of the tumor, I'll live longer and I'll lose language ability, ability that in many ways defines who I am. How do I choose? My uncle said, you don't choose. You'll get both, language and being alive. I heard what he said. I wrote it down. And this is still prowling around inside me, a question of my priorities. My number one priority, which I can recognize with no ambivalence, is being alive for Maybell. But language, talking, writing, thinking, being outraged, being passionate, being curious, being able to connect with the people I love is a significant second priority. So important that it's a millimeter below priority number one. In the early months of the blog, Allison establishes a style, a distinctive set of concerns and formal features. In the late months of the blog, she adapts that style to the increasingly urgent questions of disability and illness. On December 16th, 2015, she writes about chemotherapy. Um, and in a, it's called, Oh, how, how I Hate the IV Infusion. The Madeline of memory here is the smell of antiseptic soap, which reminds her of the time when Maybell was in the NICU for a week after she was born, uh, quote, only because they were concerned that she had Down syndrome. There wasn't anything other than that. After we discovered her fantastic pediatrician, he said that what she needed was time outside every day, end quote. Using bullet points, Allison links this medical treatment to her own. It can take forever for the medicine to be delivered. Once, in the last month, it took two hours for them to even bring the medicine for the IV infusion. I sat in a chair, plugged into everything, but doing nothing for an extra two hours. That sucks. 
I'm sitting here right now getting some prophylactic medication for diarrhea slash nausea slash agony. That's a good thing, actually, not one that I hate. And the nurse just discovered that it's actually going to take longer than she thought because the doctor wanted to see how much I weigh. I was 139 pounds a few weeks ago, now I'm back at 149, which is very good because it means I'm moving back to the normal weight of my body, 155 since I was in grad school. She discovered that we're going to have to wait some more because my weight change required a revision in my dosage. What the hell? <laughs> now I'm home. I'm exhausted, falling asleep, but I wish I could take a shower and throw all my clothes in the laundry. I'm too tired for that right now, but the smell of my clothing is hard to take when the clothing is so near to me. The smell is the first item on my list of things I hate about IV infusion. Breaking my heart sometimes. To me, Allison's use of bullet points expresses a paradox. She clearly likes their punchy, organized approach. She wanted to get things done. Note her impatience with waiting for chemo. And yet she understands the way that life is not a memorandum or to-do list and therefore cannot be contained. At the same time, the form is perfect for the rich inner life of a nonlinear thinker. For an active mind, showing up for chemo, memories of your daughter's time in the hospital, and thinking about cancer's meaning are the to-do list. She expresses all this not through formal argumentation, but by playing with form. That play was deadly serious, a necessary labor. Note that Allison describes herself as too tired to take a shower and throw clothes in the laundry, but not too tired to write. Some of Allison's best writing occurs late in the blog, as she resists the loss of language and somehow turns that deficit against itself. And this is another bullet point. Here's an awful change. I couldn't remember Maybell's name twice recently. Couldn't remember. May. Motherfuck. My daughter. This is a deft, imaginative moment. The post is compressed and moving. Allison ably dramatizes the loss of ability and remembers a gap in memory, uses words to evoke the loss of words. Her profanity is also a play on words. The ellipses, a scholar's punctuation, stand for absence. On March 30th, 2016, Allison wrote a post entitled, Changing My Body Would Help and Terrified Me. To me, one of the most significant parts of the post is the introductory note, where Allison both notes that she's deliberately left errors in place, another literary experiment, and sought editing help. And here's the note. Preface, what is written below is the result of my challenges with language. Brian did some minimal editing, but you will see some evidence of the problems I am experiencing. In this note, Allison became her own editor, a scholar of her own essay. In doing so, she makes an essayistic choice, a surprising and expressive formal move. At the same time, by highlighting the fact that she received help with writing and editing, she shows that interdependence is a part of life. Even with her language impaired, even in the throes of illness and extreme stress, Allison was thinking as a creative writer, questioning the boundaries of disability, giving us access to her experience. In doing so, she advanced the conversation, my hope is that the conversation will continue. Thank you. Thank you. So we have we have time for questions? Yes? So I'm I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Try to answer them anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. How long did it take you to put all that together? Over a year? Uh, this paper, you mean? Yeah. About a week. Mm -hmm. I, well, th I spent a week writing it. Um, and, but there was a lot of preliminary work uh, that, so the research part, there is a solid two or three weeks in there, but there's a certain point where it's, you know, the, the stressful magic of deadlines. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> so I, I just, I, I kind of did what Allison did, I just, I just wrote it. So it's, uh, that's been the last week. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I, I'll, I'm happy to do so, by, but um, this, is, this is where I really wish I obviously had Allison here or my co-editor, Rachel Adams, both of whom Allison knew and Rachel knows a lot more about this. I'm, I'm essentially a poet who wandered into disability <laughs> studies. Um, so one, one, big, uh, one big thing that Allison and I tried to do was to speak up about medicalization, which is to say treating um, Down syndrome was what we talked about a lot, treating that purely as a disease, a defect, or an abnormality. So um, Allison was interested, I am interested in, it, in the way that we talk about human differences and the way that our language prejudges them. And um, 